I'm so pleased to be here in this cathedral of Corpus. We, we are in this most amazing building and um, I feel humbled. I, uh, I had a little bit of um, experience before this. I, as a teenager, I played the trumpet in York Minster and it had an echo just like this did. And so it's my second experience of, of performance in a cathedral. Uh, I'm going to have to apologize for a few things. Some of the slides that uh, I'm going to show you today have been shown before, and so Carmen Dairel will have seen them. I hope most other people haven't. Uh, uh, I apologize if you are from um, Liechtenstein. Uh, I don't know if anybody here is from Liechtenstein, but Liechtenstein will get a mention later on. And Susan Conrad's uh, reference to bridges, I put some pictures of bridges in. You won't get any dinosaurs today. Okay, well, the issue I'm going to talk about today has to do with uh, <coughs> collecting text and filtering its aboutness, Fil filtering the texts so as to attempt to get texts which I think are more... Uh, about what I want them to be about. It ties in with um, work that we've heard about uh, during this conference, um, but this is the kind of low-tech approach today. We're getting the low-tech approach. Most of the work I've done has been with the attempt to do something which people could do on a laptop and not in a big laboratory with sophisticated resources. So I'm not going to be able to show you anything with very sophisticated resources at all today. We're just interested in checking and filtering the aboutness of text which you might collect if you use any of these sources like LexisNexis or Factiva, uh, which your university may have a subscription to and allow you to download texts from. And quite a lot of people seem to be doing that nowadays. and so. I think there are considerable problems with it. I work with, um, <clears throat> well, I, I no longer work in a way. I play at uh, developing my software, and, uh, that, and I play with my grandchildren, and I ride motorbikes, and I have fun when I can until the Zimmer frame comes along. Um, but uh, when I work, I <coughs> do research with um, a sociologist professor at the University of Nottingham, Rainer Grundmann, and um, a colleague, Kim Sue Kreischer, who I think is probably here. Uh, and they know about the sociology of the documents, but some of my work is to try to help clean up the corpora that we collect. And so that's really what I'm on about today, How, working with getting hold of the corpus and cleaning it up and getting something which the problem really is basically if you collect texts about a particular topic, are they really about that or is the, or is the treatment merely incidental? So that's what I'm going to be concerned with today. <coughs> there, the topics therefore might be things like, well in this case climate change, but it could be topics we've worked on, uh, the topic of austerity one of the problems we had was what actually counts as a text about austerity, what, what is meant by austerity. If you've got a text which talks about, for example, a company's sh shares, a major company like British Telecom's shares going up or going down, uh, uh, that might be in some context of austerity, and austerity might well get mentioned in the text quite considerably, it might get mentioned throughout the text, but is really a company report type of text, and is that really austerity at all? And that, that's the sort of problem that I'm trying to tackle today. So we're concerned with aboutness. Now, years ago, as uh, Lawrence said, I used to work in language teaching, and I was um, interested in main points, the main points, how do you get students to recognize the main points of a text, how do you get them to ignore unnecessary detail which they can't understand, can't remember, and will, will never really be able to use, but how can they sort of plough through a text efficiently, gaining the main points? And of course the difficulty there is knowing what are the main points of a text, what c constitutes a main point, and how do we know, how would we ever recognise a main point if it came and hit us in the face? <coughs> so, the gist. 
how do you deal with gist? And of course that interest took me into repeated words and repeated words, big surprise, took me later on in my life in the 1990s to keywords and comparing, uh, comparing repeated words or words which are repeated more often. Uh, what actually happened there, just incidentally, was that on a given Tuesday, I was supposed to give a talk at the University of Liverpool, a staff student talk, and I'd committed myself to this weeks ahead of time. <coughs> and on the weekend, I, I was thinking, what the hell am I going to do? I don't have a talk. And uh, what I'd been doing was I'd had a student who wanted to analyze the words of her texts because she was interested in, in the um, vocabulary, whether vocabulary was presented efficiently, unit one's vocabulary, does it come back in unit three, unit five, and so on, is vocabulary repeated in some sort of way that would help her students? This was Fadila from Malaysia. Were, were the words coming back in time for the student to actually learn them, or were they getting repeated or not? She needed a word listing program, and so I was just playing with a word listing, making one for Fadila. <coughs> some of the tools I've done, you probably do the same thing, don't you, are for people who ask you for something and you can see they've got a need and you think, oh, that would be quite neat, quite a, a fun exercise to try and make it, let's see if we can. So I was making a word list program and then on the Saturday morning I was playing with it. I had this text about race, racing results and it had all these horses' names and Morning Star was winning the, the 330 and all that sort of stuff. Uh, and I compared that text, the word list of that text, with a collection of, of texts that it, that it came from, from other Guardian texts. Luckily, my brother worked for the Guardian, and I had a sort of inside way of getting hold of Guardian text, which was, in those days, pretty well impossible to achieve otherwise. That's a good idea. Thank you. Brilliant. Anyway. By the Tuesday, the keywords idea had come out because I, I had to filter out Morning Star and Lightning that were winning the, the, some of the races. Uh, uh, that had to be a threshold of not more than so many mentions of a given racehorse, but the idea of horses and racing and so on came out with the keywords procedure. That was way back then with the repeated words procedure in the early 90s or mid 90s. Okay. Uh, 1978, Kinch and Van Dyke's key article came out <coughs> about relevance in which they have a diagram which looks like that and it's basically how re propositions are, are repeated and you can see linkages, these numbers refer to propositions in a particular text and they're all linked in various ways and some of them, some of them quite clearly are key, that one there and that one there, they get referred to numerous ways and they're interlinked. So <laughs> always interest in that sort of thing. Now if you think about texts in general, they seem to mostly relate to a clear field of knowledge as you may say. So there's the famous text way from way back in the 1950s, Silent Spring, which relates to ecology and then we've got texts which refer to genetics clearly, and then biography and race, perhaps two things there, and this one here, um, <coughs> some sort of business, clear cases of text relating to a particular uh, topic. Now, uh, this is topic not in the same technical sense at all as we had with the bag of words yesterday. It's not that sort of topic, but it's, a, it's a, if you might say, a very loosely defined theme -y kind of topic. Low tech. We're low-tech today. <coughs> in language, as a language teacher, I was concerned, therefore, with the problem of how do you find appropriate texts, and if you want to deal with texts, how are you going to get texts which are really ones that the students will want to read to try to find the main points? And my colleague, uh, John Holmes, I worked with in Brazil, in the 1980s. He's no longer with us, um, <coughs> but I was very honored to work with him. And incidentally, 
uh, the whole Bra Brazilian national ESP project, which began in the late 70s and is going straight strong even now, uh, is headed up by this amazing woman, Antonietta Salani, who I happen to know is, uh, was born in 1923, and she's being, uh, there's a homage being paid to her today or yesterday in, uh, in the Isla in Rio. She was there, you can see photographs of her on Facebook, and uh, she's the most amazing person I've ever had the privilege of working with and for. <coughs> John Holmes, in this pro course of this project, came up with a notion which he called field of knowledge, where it's a pretty simple notion, really. You've got something like medicine within a field of other sciences and subjects that people can study, and that is the field of knowledge. And then you can go outside that, and this is me. You've got extras which don't really belong in the uh, in, in what he would call, in John would call the field of knowledge, the red field, which is related subjects. So you can see me coming there. Well, I'm not going to go on too much with more and more of that, but the problem, the solution that John was advocating was if you want to find a text which may be suitable for dealing with a given s set of students, maybe you could make a bridge between the subject they specialize in and a related subject of some sort, possibly not leaping right out to Pink Floyd, but going just one step out into the so-called, in what John called the field of knowledge. <coughs> um, so that would be making some sort of a bridge, and there would be an example. If, it's, if you were trying to teach engineering students, you could find a text which related to engineering and art, uh, on the grounds that the pure engineering topic would be hard for an English teacher unless they, were, they had sufficient and competent knowledge of engineering, which they might, they might be able to bullshit their way a bit, but they really probably wouldn't actually, unless uh, a, a very few people would be able to deal with it, but otherwise the other lot of people like me would just be bullshitting if they were trying to talk engineering to engineering students. But if you talked, if you found texts which related engineering to, say, uh, award-winning skyscrapers or something like that, then you're bridging over into art and it becomes much easier for all concerned. So it's that bridging idea. <coughs> Another example here, so dentistry, students of dentistry and then gender and the dental profession. Or uh, another e example here, you could c combine those two fields in that way. Now, of course, this whole thing goes on down, and then you can go right on down within phonetics, or in our case, within corpus linguistics, and in our group here, you could draw a whole lot of circles within circles, and I will belong to some of them, but not to others, and, and I'm sure we'll all find that we belong to some subfields, or sub, 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 subfields, and obviously this whole process goes on and on. But it's just a way of thinking, that's all. So, we're making bridges, and we've got subfields within fields, we've got fields which relate to each other, and a possible idea of finding bridges between them. Now, a second theme is to do with research methods and ways of doing things, and we've got the good way of doing things, the ideal way of doing things, and the inefficient way of doing things, uh, which I hope to try to illustrate. So if we look at the research process, we might have something like that, where you start off interested in something, you're, you start to investigate it, you collect data, you process that data in some way, you get an overview of what you've found out, you try to interpret what you found, you write it all up nicely, you publish it, and lo and behold, Nobel Prize, there you go. Now that, of course, is the ideal world, and it doesn't actually happen like that. In the real world, you get interested in a topic, you start with your starting idea, you uh, might need to have some people that you work with for that, you collect some data, 
you start processing the data and then you find actually the data isn't quite right and you have to go back and collect some more. So there's got going to be a series of loopbacks where something isn't quite the way you want it to be. <laughs> so overview of what was found. Where am I up to? Yeah, and uh, then we get, have to go back and say, oh, I need to collect more data and I do more processing of that data because it's still not quite right, it's not what I need. And then interpretation immediately takes you back again, of course, and so we get this sort of, a whole lot of these purple um, marks of going backwards and backwards and backwards and basically we get numerous returns to early stages. Well, why do we get that? Is it because we, we, we weren't doing the job right? Well, I don't think so. I don't think anyone can ever do this, the ideal one. Uh, it's because we've made errors. Well, to err is human. We, because the data needs cleaning up, uh, or because we find that we haven't got enough, or we've got too much, or we've got the wrong type, uh, and we've, got, we've suddenly perceived something. There, you get the sort of light bulb thing where you say, blimey, they seem to be doing such and such, I've noticed such and such, could it be that that's a part of my data and I need to go back and collect some more and, and change the nature of the research slightly, add to the data. It's a thinking process, it's a kind of piece of detective work that we're engaged in and it's not a simple follow the stages through process of course. That's, that seems pretty obvious. Now let's take an example, very simple program. This came to my mind the other day when I was <coughs> watching a workshop that Michaela was giving. And Michaela uh, was d doing the workshop last week and uh, I was sitting with her son uh, who has the, I'm the privilege of being one of his godparents. And we were sitting together. We weren't paying attention to what Michaela was doing at all. We were looking at what Richard was trying to do. He had some math stuff to be, to be playing around with. I'm going to refer to that now. I hope you don't mind, Michaela. Okay, we get a very simple program with one button, uh, with one number, to, and, and a kind of input window, and one memo for writing. And we could have a procedure like this, which is <coughs> for um, doing an addition process. This procedure, I've written this procedure in, in Pascal and it does a, a very simple recursive program. So it goes round and round, let's see, uh, this here it calls itself and goes round and round and round and round until it finishes. It finishes if it gets to this stage here. But basically the thing goes round and round and round and round and that's how it works. And when you run it, it adds the numbers up and it tells you if we start with seven, the, the, the numbers from one to seven add up to 28. So it, it, that's the way it works. It ran through this procedure which, oops, which went round and round and round. So that's just saying, please get going. And that bit there is it doing the work and then it coughs out the results. So very, very simple. It's what is called a recursive program and it uses a recursive method and um, there's the repetition coming here as it goes round and calls itself. And when you've got recursion, recursion, recursion occurring, you can get the same thing within itself. Of course, we've known about that for some years now with the whole notion of fractals. It's in ancient representations too. Of course, there's the plumed serpent of Mexico, so that's going back hundreds and thousands of years, or hundreds and hundreds of years, really, uh, a snake eating its own tail. Uh, I actually saw one on YouTube. There is a snake eating, a oh, pretty horrible thing. I thought it was so horrible, I wouldn't want you to have to look at it. Some crazy snake that got going on its own tail. Um, uh, another representation here, this is the classic one that I got from Wikipedia where this brand of coffee uses a picture of the girl uh, holding the tray, is in a, holding a picture of herself holding the, the um, 
the, the tin, and that's got a picture, and so on. It goes like, like mirrors, like double mirrors. And so recursion, we go, here we go again, round and round and round and round. I, I thought, well, I'd ask Richard how he would do it if I asked him how you would add up the numbers, uh, if do, do this process with 10 or, or some other number. And he immediately knew the answer because there is a much quicker way. If you want to know the numbers, how to add up the numbers from one to a thousand, well, you don't do it like that. That wouldn't be a bad way of working. Instead, you notice that adding the top number to the bottom number gives you a certain result. And that if you did the same thing with the next pair from the top and the second to bottom, like that, you'd get the same thing. And if you do the next pair and so on down, they always give you that same sum. And then you just need to know how many pairs are there. And you get a very easy, simple solution. It's 500 pairs. And you add the top to the bottom number, 1,001. And then you just multiply them. And that's the result you get. And Richard Schilling is expert at doing that sort of thing. And I thought that was very good. And I'd like to mention him for using a much cleverer way than, uh, than you could use otherwise. So, inefficiency. In the real world, we never go through research. We're, we're unlikely to find a highly efficient method. We can with something simple like this sort of mathematical problem, but in many of our corpus problems, there, isn't a simple, there may not be a simple and easy way to work because our issues are more complex than maths algorithms uh, can, can show. The news download study, okay, so it's with a collection of text from LexisNexis, and the objectives here were to find a suitable corpus of climate change articles, and we wanted to use UK broadsheet uh, press, collecting it using LexisNexis, and uh, so the question is, what is a climate change article and how do we deal with that? With the same issue that we've tackled with Brexit, the same issue that we've tackled with austerity and other issues, energy security and so on. There are other pieces of work which have done similar, which have de dealt with similar issues. The uh, Monica Bednarik's uh, latest book um, about news text, they used, in one of her studies, she used Factiva texts on cycling <coughs> and she collected them using uh, quite a complex set of search terms and basically the method they had to do was to skim read the texts to be able to decide are these texts actually related to cycling or not or are they just mentioned in passing. So that was, that's one uh, piece of relevant literature and then there's Carming Dyrell's work where she, I heard some more this morning about other, uh, other work she's done, but she did some in 2015 where she collected text from Factiva and used uh, a series, quite a number of search terms. Uh, this is in the Brazilian press um, using search terms on urban violence and uh, a few other terms which were to be excluded. They were ones that you didn't want and that was how she worked to, to, to uh, <coughs> work on urban violence. The problem, is the, I think this is quite an interesting quote, any reference to urban violence is considered relevant even if urban violence is not the main topic discussed in the text. So in her case, she, with her particular focus, it didn't matter if a text only incidentally was dealing with urban violence and, and that's a perfectly respectable thing to be doing. In our case with climate change we wanted to find texts which really were about climate change. Now if you're using many thousands of texts uh, then I think a data mining kind of approach can, can bring in uh, interesting methods and interesting can give you some interesting findings. Of course, it's very, very difficult to read, to skim read many, many thousands of texts. I'm very pleased to say that I found out that this software, which I presented in, I think, 2000 or 1999 in uh, Graz, in the TALC conference, um, came out in 2002. Actually, it still runs. 
and I hadn't tried it out for a few years. You know, that's the trouble with software. It's, it always keeps changing, and Microsoft keep moving the goalposts. Uh, luckily, they mostly move the goalposts the right way, so that everything gets a lot faster. But it can cause difficulty when things don't, don't, don't work anymore. But this software actually still does, and it's from 2002. What that did was to take 800,000 texts from the Guardian newspaper and um, work out the keywords of them and build a big keyword database and then look to see which words are key, a key keyword database, and then see which words are present in the same text as a given keyword is found. <coughs> so these are what I call the associates. Uh, not a lot of work, has, in my, to my knowledge, has been done on that, but it's quite interesting if you're dealing with a very large number of texts. And here, what we've got is the output. If you take the word climate, you get a whole series of, if you like, uh, items that head up various groups, like here's drought and temperature and centered and tropical and so on, and each one. These are, if you like, in the case of climate, uh, there are some texts which have climate as a keyword and have drought as a keyword. And when they do have drought as a keyword, as well as climate, they also have things, words like reservoirs and rains and arid as keywords. And so there the associates clump together in this particular sort of way. Now that's possible if you've got a very large number of texts, and that is quite, quite interesting, but I think it should be complemented. <coughs> complemented. But if we, can, if we want to try to ensure that the texts are suitable, we might have a, a problem of, of the actual aboutness of each, each individual text. So in our particular procedure here, we took, uh, we used the download parser and we downloaded the text from LexisNexis. We processed the, them using this parser to, you, uh, the search terms were global warming and climate change and greenhouse effect, and we collected texts from The Guardian, The Times, The Telegraph, The Independent, and The Observer, and all together got 120,000 texts like that. <coughs> and we cleaned up the stuff, so you get a kind of header with the information that you can get out of the LexisNexis download, and you know, what language is it in, what sort of newspaper is it from, what is the date, and so on. Uh, it's also possible to parse out the headlines and uh, be able to separate them out and mark them out too. But of course, there's a big problem with duplicate texts. Uh, some of the texts seem to be repeated. Why do they get repeated? Because the newspaper changes a few words because of some legal problem or because they like the article and they republish it on a, in the Western edition or in the Southern edition or they sell it to another newspaper or whatever it might be. So there's a, an algorithm for trying to find and get rid of duplicate texts. I won't go into that in, in detail now. There's a problem with ongoing text, which I've heard several interesting presentations about this in this conference, where you've got text which is in some way growing or incomplete. So you've got letters page articles where you've got several stories in one, and th that, that's hard if, the, if they're not marked up. One article, multiple stories. You've got text growing, where <coughs> you have stories with times in them, and the 9.52, and this has happened, 10.11, this has happened, the journalist is writing during the event, and so a story which is growing, and how do you know when it stops? Uh, and then you've got online comment, and, and where, of course, the desirable thing would be to separate out the online comment from the text. Uh, we heard about that with uh, McGlashan and Baker's talk on, <coughs> on uh, Romania. But my problem I'm addressing today is, are they really about climate change? <clears throat> we have to decide what counts as a climate change text. Is a description of a green energy, is that climate change? Does that count? What about a text on investments in oil? Does that count? Because they all come out. They all come in the download. Uh, so we, we, we struggled to agree even between us uh, three of us that were doing the research on 
austerity, what counts as austerity, and we had to kind of argue about it, and so it's not just a simple matter uh, deciding. I, don't, I think if, you asked, if I asked all of you here about certain texts, we'd only get a, a rather low modicum of agreement. Uh, so what is needed is, well, we, what we have is the wording, um, and what we assume is that they contain the relevant phrases, and we need to sort of filter them out. So, one of the procedures used was to take of the articles which had got through the download parser as not being duplicated and cleaned up and so on with headers and so on and so forth, to take a hundred of them and see actually are they, are they uh, about climate change or not and what can be done about it. And so a kind of filtering procedure was devised where you say it, they must contain certain phrases or they must not contain certain phrases. And of course, this is a, like a setting that you can type in and say, I want to parse them. And also, down here, I've got some sort of indication as to how often they occur in various parts of the text. Are they spread, th spread, are they spread through the text? uniformly through the text, or do they all come at the beginning or something like that? Do they come in every part of the text or every third of the text or whatever it may be? So we've got several outlier, outliers coming where texts don't actually meet the requirement. Here, um, what's this one? We've got, a, we've got some reference to climate change right at the very end of the text only. Uh, this one we've got a text on the year in review. It's, a, it's talking about the whole year of 20,000, and we've got some reference just coming incidentally. In this particular one, we've got something about gardening, which relates gardening, which to me would be one of the outside things in my frame of knowledge, of my field of knowledge, gardening and climate change, where, which spans across a very wide bridge. <coughs> Lexis Nexis, the way Nexis Nexis works is, is, is a black box. It's, they give you some information, but not very much. Okay, which sections of the press? Well, they come from various sections of the press, and of course, it's possible to, to operate filters. Uh, we didn't actually want to, but it's possible to eliminate, say, blogs or, or whatever. The bulk of them came from, from news text here. Uh, um, but the problem is that basically, uh, the UK broadsheets, and I don't know whether that's true of other broadsheets elsewhere, they don't use rigorously defined uh, categories at all. It's really quite confusing. So home news and uh, <coughs> internal, uh, it, what's, the, what's the distinction between home and news? Or international, uh, it's, that's pretty clear what that is, but leader and editorial seem to refer to the same thing. And different newspapers have got different traditions. And in my experience, what happens is the Sun newspaper and the Daily Mail and the Guardian and the Times send the stuff off to LexisNexis, and somebody in LexisNexis sort of uh, puts it into their database, but doesn't do much standardization at all. Uh, uh, perhaps because it would cost too much or because it would be too difficult to get the Guardian to do it. I'm not surprised if, in the, incidentally, in the case of a newspaper like the Guardian, my, say my brother used to work there, and he would, uh, well, just to give an example, um, the Guardian lost its own archive at one point, and luckily my brother had given me a great chunk and I was able to give it back. <laughs> so. <coughs> um, they're busy trying to produce the press. They ought to be looking after their archive, but actually the ar maintaining the archive and supporting it well is quite complex and costs money. And it's the f uh, when John Bird took over the BBC, one of the first things he did was cut out the archive or reduce the archive and reduce the history of the BBC to a very minor uh, part indeed it had been funded before and was no longer funded and my uncle who worked for the BBC was pissed off because it was his one of his jobs where am I up to okay uh, so the UK broadsheets do not use rigorously defined section names what about the headlines would that help us well Many of the headlines are actually not a fat lot of use. Uh, it's a dirty job, but someone's got to do it. It blights all our lives. 
How useful is that for telling you whether this is really climate change? These are all headlines from the climate change download. Are they, can you tell from the headline, you know, Saturday Review, fiction, hot slots, a story of love, climate change, and the share index. Now, is that really going to be about climate change, or is it really about love? Or is it really about the share index? Uh, the mind boggles. Blair, we must renew Trident. Uh, that doesn't look like climate change at all, and so on. Sometimes you get help, so you can get, you know, keywords that come in which tell you that you're likely to be on the right sort of general track. So the headlines can help a bit, but the, it seems that with the UK press you basically can't do much. Now, it may be that in other cultures the, the headlines are much better at informing, but I think in the British press what actually happens is people are joking and there's a kind of uh, 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 some sort of punning reference that's often made, and so the headline doesn't really help you at all if you're trying to do this job of filtering uh, corpus aboutness. <clears throat> so some headlines are quite helpful, uh, some are not helpful at all. This particular uh, one about must, must try harder, the Labour government started well enough, it, it actually seems to have quite a lot of stuff about climate change. The, the words, little, there's a little extract there with some words marked in, in uh, blue that that were climate change words that were in the filter that was being required. And down at the bottom we see the numbers suggest that the, there's a fair distribution of the terms throughout the text. And so that one actually passed muster. Sometimes we've got the topic climate change with its field of knowledge. And uh, sometimes the, there's a kind, what you might call a nonce connection, not a field of knowledge connection, where it's there's something quite outside climate change that you wouldn't think of as any kind of related field. That's what we found. So climate change could be just merely incidental. And that's where my apology comes if you're from Liechtenstein. I got this from the web somewhere. Somebody thought that Liechtenstein was incidental. So the automatic filter process works like this, looking for certain terms, and then goes into the filter and searches through. And <coughs> the items are sorted in the text to see are they found, and you must meet a minimum number of terms. Uh, and they have to be spread in some sort of appropriate way. And it's possible to tweak those settings. So it's a sort of refining process. So you go on and on, choosing words, changing the words, finding better ones, tweaking again, going back and looking at the output, seeing whether the texts you're getting are the ones you want or not. And so this is a sort of iterative, uh, in a way, an iterative um, process. Now you then would say, well, uh, what do you end up with? Right? We've got the number of texts reduced considerably to about a quarter. Uh, are they really climate change texts now? Well, actually, even then, there's actually no guarantee. Because even if they've gone through this process, you can get some things like here, I've got a case where there are assorted stories all in the same text. Right, so it, it, it was enough mention of climate change freight words and phrases to get through the thing, and they were spread out enough through the text, but nevertheless, it was a series of assorted texts all in one. I've got another example here where it's uh, gym equipment. Uh, so the text is about the idea that you might be generating your own energy by uh, doing exercise in a gym. Um, is that a climate change text? It's certainly an exercise text. Uh, I, I think this would be, this is a bit arguable. I'm not sure, what do you think? Is it climate change? If, it's, if you think it's a climate change text, could you raise your hand, please? I'm not getting many hands up. Most people are not, uh, maybe you're not very brave. So let's try again. If it's a climate change text, would you raise your hand, please? 
Oh, we get more now. Yeah, okay. But we still not get very many. Okay. Now, uh, uh, this is a fun text. Uh, can you read that, or is it too small? Let's see. Uh, uh, just how unlucky is the Prince of Wales? I mean, wasn't the whole point of C Camilla that she was low maintenance, sustainable, and compared with Diana, unbelievably low on emissions? <laughs> One reason I've always had so much respect for the Prince was his pioneering appreciation of the fact that women, just like anything else, can be compared and chosen on the base of their carbon footprint. In the early days, you could see that Camilla was totally in agreement. She travelled everywhere by horse, killed a lot of her own food, and famously made a single lipstick last for three decades. But is it just Camilla, or do a lot of women get less green as they get older? Look at her today, hot baths, highlights, new clothes all the time, and now healthy Scottish holidays aren't good enough. She's got to take a private jet to the Greek islands for a cruise on one of those motor yachts that consumes 100 gallons of fuel an hour. Okay, this test passed the filter. It's climate change, isn't it? But it's clearly Prince Charles and making fun, right? Um, it's a nice text, but um, is it really what we want in a corpus of climate change text? Well, I don't know. I'm not quite sure if I asked you to put your hands up on that one, what you would, what you would say. Uh, <clears throat> okay, here we've got a battery batteries on wheels, vehicle to, text, to grid technology allows electric cars to store energy text. So we've got another text which sort of links climate change with transport, right? So it basically here we've got one where we've got climate change related to cooking, okay? So we're getting this bridge idea. It's not perfect by any means. Climate change and drama, a little piece of text which refers to climate change and drama. So we can, uh, we can do this filtration. The cleanup process therefore is iterative, it's recursive, it goes back and, and back and it needs to be done time and time again. And I think there's a lot of checking up. It's, in, in essence, it's presupposes what you wanted to find out. We want to build a corpus of the right kind. To do that, we have to build a corpus of the wrong kind and then start refining it and refining it and refining it until it gets nearer to what we actually wanted in the first place. But my argument is that it's, uh, it's quite difficult to be sure that we've got a corpus which actually does contain texts which are about the thing we, we're interested in. Uh, and to my shame, some of the work I've done in the past hasn't done that filtration as, as it needed to be done. So it's a bootstrap problem in a way. It's not bootstrapping in, in another sense. I know that's also used as a technical term, but it's this sort of bootstrap where you're trying to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. And this is a representation of somebody attempting to do it. Doesn't usually succeed. Okay, to my conclusions then, it's a sort of filtering process. We've got a bootstrap problem where we are trying to create our corpus and to do it we have to create the corpus and then go round and round filtering. We refine by, in this particular case, by manually selecting keywords from an imperfect corpus. So I think I forgot to mention that, that the terms and phrases that were used to f do the filtering were, came from a keywords analysis of the corpus itself. Uh, then reanalyzing and refiltering. And uh, texts typically bridge one field with another. I think it's unlikely that we will ever find a truly efficient non iterative method, but I just proposing this as maybe something to go along with other much more sophisticated statistical methods that we heard about yesterday with bags of words in, in, in various bins. I think we're rather unlikely to get a pure corpus which human agree agreements agree 100% on. I think that's, that's another of these impossible things that nobody would ever get. Even if you only wanted a corpus of five texts that, that human co agreements the human agreement would be 100% on would be asking, asking a hell of a lot. If you wanted 50 texts or 500 texts or 500,000 texts, much, much harder. 
uh, and that's in a way part of the paradox, part of the trouble that we're, that we're living with. Uh, and at that point, I think I shall dry up. Thank you very much.